Britain's lifeblood seeps away as desperately needed cargoes fail to reach British ports. Civilian vessel destroyed, sir. Only the slow, cold drawing of lines on charts which showed potential strangulation. The Axis powers can never achieve their object of world domination unless they first obtain control of the seas. All our plans depended upon the defeat of this menace. Torpedoes away! Mortal danger to our lifelines gnawed my bowels. I am going to proclaim the Battle of the Atlantic. Massive war games have entered the scene here at Shelfside with Atlantic Chase. See, this game offers a new type of mechanic where both players don't quite know where ships are, their ships, and their opponents. Yep, this is a two-player chase all shrouded in mystery of the Atlantic Ocean, as you see if the Kriegsmarine or the home fleet can take the upper hand in this conflict. Let's go back to 1939. So now we're gonna go over the rules of Atlantic Chase. <laughs> Just kidding, okay? Seriously, did you think we could go over this 64 pages and then this 50 page tutorial with this four page player aid? Yeah, no way. This is just gonna be the bare bones explanation. So the gist is that one player is playing as the mighty British Empire versus the stealthy Kriegsmarine in one of many scenarios with wind conditions mostly revolved around escape with your weak ships to your own ports and sink the enemy ships. To get you started on moving, you want to take an action to plot a trajectory. This plots a course for all of the ships in that group, or because this is a war game, aka a task force. You can put down as many little Catan roads as you want, and your ships are somewhere along that line. What? What, what, what does that even mean that my ships are somewhere along this line? Okay, so in this game you're playing as a naval commander, which means that you're sitting in a war room far away from the actual ocean, and you're operating off of imperfect information, all you know is that your ships are somewhere along this line that you've plotted. So then to actually move the ships, well, you want time to pass, and then you take out some of these trajectory markers. If enough time passes and you take out all the trajectory paths, well, the last one you remove gets replaced by a station, which is where your ships have to be. Then the chase comes in as you cross trajectories with your opponent using actions like a naval search to try to see if your opponent is there. Sometimes when you do that, you will get to remove some of their paths of your choice. Or, which is more exciting, your crew will say, Vessel spotted, sir! And then their trajectory turns into a station, meaning that they have to be there. Now you can feel the adrenaline of the hunt as your target is right before you, and you can perform another action to engage. If you succeed, well, get your guns ready, because we're going to duke it out on this battle board. Players will take turns looking at this gigantic menu of options, picking one, and then choosing to pass their turn, until one of the scenario win conditions are completed. Like if in the first scenario, the German convoy Bremen escapes to its port. That is the bare bones of this game. You're plotting courses, then choosing an action that usually amounts to trying to find your opponent, Time will pass, and then you take off some of your courses. And then eventually, you'll fight on this side battle board if you find your opponent or if you are found yourself. So now on to the depths of the Atlantic with the review. And first off, let's talk about the components. There's a hell of a lot of them. Like the sheer content of stuff you get in this game is really quite crazy. This box, when completely full, is going to weigh about 4 pounds. Why that heavy? Well, besides all these pieces, you're going to get that. You're going to get all these super dense booklets and guides to help you play the game. And then also, there's this double-sided game board, which unlocks even more. And this stuff all fits inside the box super neatly. There's also a ridiculous amount of wooden components for all of your warships in four different colors. For a frame of reference, these are literally the same size as Catan Roads. Then there's four really nice dice, two for each color, which are really great quality, which is good because you'll be constantly rolling them. Ah, then yeah, the ships. You get a lot of them. 
Emphasis on the bulk of the home fleet here, because the British have over 50 ships to use, many with unique stats and names. You got the famous Prince of Wales, and then the aircraft carriers like the Glorious. You got the many bajillion light cruisers, and hey look, you even get the half-muggle Hermione. The Kriegsmarine have less, at 20 ships, which, you know, is still a lot. There's a legendary Bismarck, and even the heavy cruiser of the Graf Spee. As for this board, yeah, it can seem really daunting at first with all these tables everywhere, but don't worry, these will all make sense and be super useful once you know the game. It's great that the white hexes on the board just make spaces really pop out. In fact, the size of the hexes just feel perfect for constantly overlaying trajectory paths all game. Oh, and you know how games normally have like one player aid? Well, this has three player aids. So let's ignore the campaign one and the advanced one for now. So when looking at this, it's completely, completely jam-packed with information, which makes it feel like one of those SparkNote study guides you'd find at a bookstore. Like a study guide, it's not meant to be read from front to back and will not make any sense if you don't know the game. But it is extremely useful when you do know gameplay, especially because it has all these clear explanations for the actions, which saves you an insane amount of time. And the game has a tutorial to get you started. This is far from perfect, and we'll get back to it. But it will eventually teach you the game with a story of its own, so once you invest enough time, you'll learn some naval history and learn the game in a structured way. What was the saving grace for learning is the first two-player scenario, which is shorter and doesn't use combat at all. Let's get to gameplay, and of course, we have to praise the innovative trajectory system where you're placing a wooden piece to plot the course for your ships. See, this doesn't have any hidden info like cards, but you're still filled with mystery because with all these pieces on the board, you're still not sure where your ships really are. It's like, well, are they here at that island? Are they here at the French coast? Or are they here at port? What you do know is that time will eventually pass and let you narrow down where your ships are not anymore. They definitely can't be there anymore. So when placing your Catan path down, it's all free. You can put down up to 15 segments, which is basically the entire board if you want to. Now this is a real challenge, because not only are you trying to plot the correct course, but sometimes you may not want to place that many segments yet. Oftentimes, you will be debating on what course to set to arouse the least intel, which are punishing markers if you route through an enemy. And you may want to err on the side of placing less, because once you put down a segment, you can't take it off unless time passes, and then you can only take it off from the end. This is a system that, to our knowledge, has not been done in any other game before, and just ends up being an amazing device to make you really feel like a fleet commander. Information is imperfect. You don't want to give orders to just make any route, lest you get intersected in a bad location. And in fact, Sometimes you want to use some trickery and choose an unorthodox path to port. The designer actually recommends that sometimes you just let your ships chill in the port and just wait to see what your opponent does first. This innovative path system is the foundation of every single other action because you always want to be repositioning in the Atlantic. Then when you take a lot of those actions with your ships, those are influenced by the length of the connecting paths. So you gotta be careful about where you want to intersect your opponent, with how much length, or if you just want to path away like a little chicken. No shame at all on that in this game. And we're proud to announce that despite this game scope and all the components and diagrams, the gameplay is rather fast paced. When first approaching the turns, it seems so open-ended and loose. There's no true turn end, so you can just keep doing as many actions as you want. Then, you learn that after almost every single action, there's these symbols, which means that your opponent can just straight up take the turn from you. Yeah, your opponent is straight up going to do some D&D &D stuff and roll for initiative. No kidding. It's just that in this game, they call it Vi for initiative and Seize initiative. If they get the right roll, they just straight up take the turn from you. Oh, and then this gets more and more likely with every single failed roll. As they will move up this tally marker, it gives a plus one to later roll for initiatives. This system does so many things right for dynamic two-player gameplay. You're always focused on your opponent's turns, because with every single action they make, you could be going next, or there's even ways to interrupt your opponent. As for when it's your turn, you have to be super careful about sequencing your actions, because there's a chance that your opponent will just take the turn from you. 
Or who knows, maybe they'll have bad rolls and you'll be able to keep going. And that feeds into the excitement of getting back to back actions. Actually, say you don't want to take the turn from your opponent and you're chill with what they're doing. In that case, you have the option to take an evasion token, which is something you put on a task force. And you can spend it to modify die rolls later after they've been rolled. Or it guarantees that one ship just pieces out of combat. Very useful and gives you some fun decision making whether or not you want to let your opponent keep taking their turn. Actually, if you feel like a naval mastermind, why not challenge your brain and play the other side? Each side in this game feels completely different. Her Majesty's service, the home fleet, is huge with tons of small ships, a couple of big ones, and then spread all across the Atlantic in most scenarios. The British have the huge advantage in air superiority and will constantly be using Britain as an airfield to launch air strikes. But now we slide on over to the Germans and they gotta play a little more sneaky. See, they're always outnumbered as they don't have that many ships to prey on British shipping lanes. But with that German technical innovation, their ships are better. They're faster than their British counterparts and can sometimes take more hits before sinking. In fact, because of their speed, they're so good at gobbling up those British convoys and then also taking care of any smaller ships that may just be sitting out there by themselves. Playing either of these sides will feel like a fresh game with the same scenario. The Germans are raging at the British airfields, but then they'll be so happy when the weather happens to turn bad in between turns and then they can strike without being bombarded or sighted from planes. These mechanics lead up to how Atlantic Chase, emphasis on the chase part, does this whole cat and mouse thing extremely, extremely well. You can just feel the ships sailing across the board as you take off the trajectories and by that, you're narrowing down where they could be now. Different ships will have different speeds too, like a convoy. Being a sitting duck, it's so slow, letting you only remove two pieces off a turn, while the hunting German ships are fast, and they can let you remove four a turn. That's scary. But don't worry, the British have more ships. They have the home fleet. So it's their job to retaliate against the haunting German ships. And this is where the crazy dog chasing mouse, chasing cat, dog chasing cat, chasing mouse game begins. There's the convoys being chased by Germans and those in turn are being chased by your huge Navy with battle cruisers and aircraft carriers. And those hunting Germans are dead meat if they run into that. But then there are bigger German ships too that are really strong. And if any of those run into the smaller British ships that are used for blockade purposes, those Brits are dead meat. Cheerio. When these ships actually do meet each other, you'll head on to this battle board, which is a mini game of your ships duking it out. This is pretty easy to start. You just take your ships on your task force sheet, which explains all your stuff, and you move it on over to this sideboard. First off, every single ship has two different gun values, which add to the rolls. Not one, two, because there's long attacks and then closer attacks, and you can move around between attacks. Some ships even fire torpedoes when they move close enough. But at the same time, all you do to attack is still roll these dice, and ships all eventually score on the same numbers, making tallying results super easy. And hey, what do you know, there's a table that explains your hits. This super exciting part about combat is that you're often trying to run away, break away, if you're outgunned. So you're hoping that combat doesn't last too long, but you still gotta fight for at least one round first. And in every fight, both sides are so mindful in what they're targeting because when you damage something, you turn it over and that could change their stats for the entire game. Yep, when ships turn over, their stats will carry over to the main board. To the main board. So let's say this battle cruiser, the British Repulse is fast and then it gets damaged and it turns slow. And now it's slow for the entire game. The entire game. Oh, and then remember, this is like a naval fight in the giant ocean after all. So fights never last more than three rounds. So thank goodness if you can't get the right breakaway roll because you will escape eventually. This prevents the being caught from being too punishing, gives fights a real sense of urgency, and most importantly, 
very frequently just lets the ships go back to the main game board to start over the Atlantic chase all over again. So now that you know these basic ideas of movement and fighting, let's open up the floodgates on how crazy, crazy the decision making ends up being. There are, in this four page play raid, there are nine actions to choose from, nine. Oh, but then how about this, okay? You have multiple task forces to control. Like, if you wanna go crazy, even more crazy, play as the British. Sometimes they have nine different task forces to control. That's nine different groups of ships, each with different speeds, different weapon values, and different locations on the board that can all be infinitely differently plotted. Oh, but how about this? Even when time passes, there's a decision to make on how you take off pieces. Sometimes you may want to take off from the front and back for a strategical slow retreat. The insane amount of options on any given turn, especially for the British, really keep challenging you to become this mighty fleet commander with an insane choice on where and what ships should really be doing. So now for the dice rolling where the term war randomness keeps reminding you that this game is all about World War II naval fights. But even with the girth of, there's a lot of ways that this game gives you partial successes to really make it feel like bad rolls are a waste. Now, now if you just bear with me and look at these tables, you'll notice a lot of them have symbols. They're not just misses. Sometimes these symbols actually mean you contact the enemy, giving you a plus two to future rolls. If you're like me and never lucky, well, not to worry too much because after every action, you will time lapse, meaning you can move closer to your target if you want, or you can move away from your target. Well, if you're closer, that actually increases your probabilities with every check, giving you this nice Da -da, da -da, da -da, feeling as you inch closer to your target. Combine this with how there's even ways to reduce your opponent's trajectories, and man, there's a lot of ways to influence and plan around your roles. Now, Atlantic Chase is a long game, but it does a really good job of just dialing you in to continuously update your strategies because the board state is always changing. Damaged ships move much slower, routes will be broken and then reformed, and hell, what about a really strong ship, like the German Bismarck being sunk? And that will completely change the dynamic of the sea. Actually, let's say the German player decides to go on the hunt with the Gnasio and the Scharnholst, hopefully I'm saying that right, and they're trying to hunt down the British ships for more points. This is extremely scary for the British, who now may have to go into defensive mode and may try to quickly unite all of his spread out ships into one giant force for a head on battle. Or instead, the British could take this opportunity of the German attack fleet leaving to amass a giant new force in front of Kiel so the Germans won't be able to dock so easily. After all, the British do have access to so many ships, so use them. Oh, but then how about there being nine completely different, fully fleshed out scenarios to choose from? Nine scenarios means there's nine different fleet setups, nine different location spawns, and even the time period of which the scenario happens affects the board. Yeah, there's even the nuance of port allegiance. In the first scenario, the war hasn't even started yet, so the French ports are considered neutral, not on Germany's side. Now, when we look at this two-player booklet, there's no question that there's so much to be experienced here. There's even later on French, American, and Soviet elements in the scenarios. While each scenario setup is always static, there's so many possible approaches that there's no question you can finish the scenario and be like, huh, wait a second, I could have routed to a different port, or I could have split my ships earlier to let those battleships actually attack. If that's not enough, well, you can play as the other side. For the sake of this review and also part of my sanity, we're not covering the campaign or the advanced rules. If you choose to go into that, these have these additional player aids, and then guess what? Replay each of the scenarios again with the advanced rules. But man oh man, maybe you just need to keep playing even when your gaming buddy is unavailable. This included solitaire booklet will let you go to absolute town. 
Now we'll get back to this, but it is great how it will give you a new story with its own flavor text, leading to so many hours of solo playtime. Whew, <sighs> okay. So in its entirety, Atlantic Chase just nails this feeling of being in the war room, riddled with anxiety on how the Atlantic will unfold. There's uncertainty abound with where your ships are, how will the checks really fare, and then if the weather will change between you and your opponent's turns. How do you want to manage all these nuanced ships of an entire European nation? There's so many! There's so many! Because so many of the mechanics of Atlantic Chase feel true to the theme, whether it be plotting a course, all the way to battling with their ship's specific guns, it makes the story of these ships you're commanding come alive. Like, there's a huge highlight on the Graf Spee, a German attack ship that has sunk, according to the included historical notes, 50,000 tons of merchant shipping. You are reliving this story of piloting the Graf Spee, trying to sink as many British convoys as possible, maybe you'll get caught by a big British fleet, exchange some blows, break away from combat, then disappear yet again into the Atlantic to eventually wind up at some German port. There's this fantastic frustration and tension where you are not this all-knowing god that has units perform exactly what you want them to do, and sometimes you don't really know where they are. Because this is naval war. In 1940s. Right, 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 okay. Uh, set a course back to port. Okay, okay, you gotta hurry, the graph speed is hot on our tail. Wait, what? What do you mean you don't know where they are? Oh, no, 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 no. Please don't have the Prince of Wales be sunk for a single German destroyer. Eight, eight, where's eight say? Where's eight? Eight? Is that good? Is it good? Oh my god! So now on to the cons. What makes this game feel a little too salty sometimes? And the first one is the learning experience. Now we are a board gaming channel, not a war gaming channel, so this is from a board game perspective. That being said, as board gamers, we were extremely irritated on how long it took to learn this game, even accounting for its length and complexity. This learning system is not that well handled. The tutorial seems like a good idea to ease you into the game, but it, it doesn't really do that. Each of the tutorial scenarios teach you the fundamentals of the game, like trajectories and how stations work, without explaining why they're important. We would have liked at least a sentence explaining that the first tutorial mission is teaching you the trajectory mechanic, and that is how you move in this game. Instead, it favors historical relevancy, which is initially cool to see, with even some dialogue. Like how about cheerio old chaps talking to each other in the naval exercise. But that coolness actually introduces a lot of fluff that slows down the learning. There's also lots of exceptions to the rules that make learning slower. You're pretty stuck with the tutorial because the rulebook is all over the place in sequencing. It talks about the core concepts, okay that makes sense, then talks about components, then leaders, and then the actions you can actually do are on page 25? There's no fact, but instead uses a really weird conversational manner to try to teach the game, which wastes space. To get a real semblance of what a turn looks like, thank goodness we have the player aids. The rulebook is really good to reference during gameplay though, with a lot of little numbers plastered all around the board and player aid telling you what page that rule is on. To learn, we recommend taking a big chunk out of an evening or two, and sitting down with the tutorial book. It is kind of funny because this game is headed down the right path with the simplified first two player scenario. So why not make this first scenario even simpler, call it a quick start so that you don't have to spend hours and hours to learn the game before you actually play it. The next con is that many of the cardboard pieces are very underwhelming in quality. Many of them are extremely tiny, like this. This is like smaller than my fingernail. Sometimes it's really hard to pick them up when they're so small. Let's zoom in so you can take a closer look. They are double-sided, meaning that you have to spend extra effort to find that one contact token you need because there's oil on the back of it. Oh hey, would you look at that? Some of these backs are actually completely empty. Actually, the biggest one of all, we realize that many of these are completely unnecessary. These have all been relegated to the useless bag, which goes underneath the game enter. <sighs> okay fine, I know you're curious about what they are, so I'll open it. Many of these are tokens that you're supposed to put down to signify you're doing an action, and then you just take it off after the die roll. 
Really? Do you need to put down a token on the board to remember the thing you are currently doing? More component ah, comes with this most important piece, the trajectory paths. Oh gosh, we really, really want these to be marked all the way around. Oftentimes, these Catan roads will flip over on their side and then you can get them confused for the blank ones. Oh, and then the stations too. These need to be marked all the way around because when they're face down, they all look blank. So you have to keep flipping them around and around. So with these component gripes, a good organization system is 100% necessary for this game. Honestly, we would just want every single cardboard chit to be way bigger. If they took out the unnecessary ones, that would let the current ones be bigger without adding any amount of cardboard. All of these component gripes tie into how the setup is long for this game, even when you have the components organized in separate bags. Look, like for the British, the pieces need to look exactly like this for the second scenario. And there's 60 ships in total. This is like a 60 piece treasure hunt or like a 60 piece puzzle you have to do before you play the game. It's like, oh, okay, gotta find the Prince of Wales, right? Okay, Prince of Wales. Okay, I got the Prince of Wales, okay, cool. I need to find the convoy. Okay, I need to find a convoy. No, I don't see it, no. Uh, convoy, no, not there. No, no, I don't think we even have one here, no. Oh, this one called Dispersed. Oh yeah, it's called Dispersed because actually the backside of Dispersed says Convoy. <sighs> God. Anyways, this would be helped with clear and bigger pieces, but the long setup is just inherent with this game. Every scenario has very detailed setups, so you gotta be patient with it. Oh, and then last con, what the heck is up with this German vessel? It doesn't have a destroyed side. That's another ship. We have no idea what the destroyed stats for these ships are. I guess we got a dud. Time to email GMT. Nitpick time. For the scenarios, set aside your schedules and plan to go in deep because it's very hard to predict how long each of these scenarios will take. Aside from the first scenario, other two player scenarios get really crazy in scope, frequently letting the British control more than a dozen ships. There's room for you to just freeze up with analysis paralysis because there's so many options from right off the bat in this game. Plus, scenario length is dictated a little bit by the Germans, of which end the scenario when all their ships leave the board. So if they're not in a position to leave the board or don't want to, the scenarios could start dragging on. But hey, this is war and things do happen, and Atlantic Chase is a long game, so you're probably prepared to spend a lot of hours anyways. On to gameplay, we're coming back to the solitaire scenarios. Now these definitely do work through our limited playthrough and feel properly tested to keep the player on their toes. But it's randomness can spring on you some bad feeling events as you roll the die and match it to the scenario table. Sometimes this can change your objective, or it can introduce new ships onto the board, which totally changes the pacing on you. It's like you're almost done and then your objective shifts and you have to spend five minutes looking for new ships to introduce to the game. This actually does feel thematic, but the pacing feels weak as any sort of setup in this game already sucks and that new objective can be unfair. This lends the solitaire to feeling more like an immersive narrative where you prioritize the historical context in the solitaire booklet and unforeseen events can just pull the rug out from underneath you with that die roll. While the randomness is also rampant in two players, we haven't yet seen an instance where it would straight up change your objective or single-handedly damage your ship on your turn. Then as for the dice, which are great, you feel like you don't get quite enough for combat. In combat, you'll almost always be doing extreme ranged attacks, which need three dice and it does feel weird to pass around this multicolored die mess between you and your friend. Then again, these are D6s, so you can just bring your own. The next nitpick is that a lot of the symbols in this game are pretty small. We've covered that the tiny cardboard chits are really annoying, but then there's also stuff like airfields on the board that are kind of hard to see at a glance. Like, why not just make these airfields bigger so you don't cover them up during gameplay? Or how about weather, which plays a huge role in this game, which is just reduced to this tiny piece with this tiny table? 
The weather is game changing, so it needs to be at least bigger than a tiny, tiny token so you don't accidentally forget it during gameplay. So now it's time for a tentative score on this game because we're just scratching the surface of what these scenario booklets have to offer. But hey, I really doubt we'd get through reviewing everything this game has to offer. So Atlantic Chase is going to get a 7 out of 10. It's tentatively good. And we are a board gaming channel, so that's how we set the standard. If we were a war gaming channel, well, I'm pretty sure this score would be much higher. Atlantic Chase absolutely delivers its promised chase in naval gameplay. It's fueled by this totally new type of movement system, of which has been in development for apparently 15 years, and the dedication shows. Like, you really have the thrill of the hunt that keeps coming in with every single action, whether it be English or German. In this multi-layered dog, chasing cat, chasing mouse game to rewrite history, you have the immense pressure of controlling multiple hunting and hunted task forces. And then the big question for you, you big naval commander, what will happen with the wartime randomness and how will you react to it? Oh, wait, wait, wartime randomness. Dice, yep, dice. If you don't like dice, or are a dice skeptic in any way, here's what you should do. Not the dice in this game, no, too much dice rolling, no! Yeah, the dice rolling is an eight out of the nine actions. This game really does have the Murphy's Law of Warfare that anything can go wrong, where it has insane amounts of output randomness, where you pick an action and then roll the dice to see what happens. You can roll all low numbers for your naval searches, and then when you finally got your aircraft carrier, the weather turns bad off a roll, and airstrikes are not allowed. Welcome to the fickleness of the Atlantic Ocean. And with that mother nature feel, the luck doesn't even out. You can have the graph speed, you need to survive. And hey, hey look, oh, oh it's raining now, yes! My praying to Zeus and Poseidon have paid off. A terrible storm just happened, whisking me safely to port without any harm at all. Now all of this luck goes side by side with this completely new type of hidden movement trajectory system that will fascinate even seasoned gamers. You will have to put down and remove so many wooden trajectories during the course of a game, constantly changing your ship's whereabouts. You and a buddy are sharing the same exact view of everything in this game, but deep down inside in your head, where do you want your ships to end up being? Maybe on your next time lapse, you will retreat instead of going forward. Remember, this is a new type of dog chasing dog, chasing cat, with so many layers type of game. And then all this comes without lying, without variable setups, and then also without cards. <sighs> You'll be constantly looking to the side of the board, checking ship speeds and gun values because those change everything and you will be trying to blast each other out of the water eventually. Each task force tells a story of its own with leaders and ships, different starting locations, and even aircraft carriers that will unlock the skies as a new tool. And hey, you literally get to use the smoking ruins of the Bismarck after a big fight. Atlantic Chase just smashes into the iceberg and drowns when it comes to accessibility, at least from our board gaming point of view. More gamers likely won't be bothered much, and if you fall into that group, you probably have a system to organize all the pieces already. Anyways, the first scenario is much simpler than the rest, but how long will it take for you to climb this mountain of organizing bits, setting up, and then learning the game to feel like you're actually playing? Kind of terrifying. There's a clear reference for everything, but no fast way to start, especially since the game's movement system is totally novel. It's like, I want to attack! Right, uh, where's my ship? Oh, it's here? Okay, uh, oh, I have to remove it from the board to move, and then it's getting longer? What's going on? I, I thought this was my ship. What? In reality, this game's structure isn't that complicated with no types of weird cards or weird phases. It's just a new type of game with all sorts of die modifiers that can really trip you up. So if you're a board gamer watching this video, tread very carefully in deciding to pick this up. We don't recommend this for most people. 
even if you're interested in naval warfare. Why not just make the content less and use that time and money to make the learning easier? Quite frankly, if the scenarios and components were cut in half, then they made a quick start guide, this game's score would skyrocket up. Hell, even if this game was more expensive than it is now, the score would go up. Sure, the replayability would go down with these changes, but replayability is not an issue at all. We could actually argue that the bloat hurts the game because it introduces so many tiny pieces that you have to spend time to organize and you probably won't get around to even using them. In all, Atlantic Chase is naval conflict love. It and the designer Jerry White demands respect on how flavorful everything is and how much bang this box gives you. Aside from the trajectory mechanic that feels absolutely at home here, there's so many smaller mechanics we don't have time to cover, like stealth attacks, ships coordinating, and even envoys dispersing. If you really want to take the plunge into this, like, like really want to, and don't mind dice, then hell, the strategy does not disappoint. Like, actually, really, buy Atlantic Chase, study long and hard to learn the game, and become that fleet commander you always thought you could be. My personal score for Atlantic Chase is going to be a 4 out of 10. It's below average for me. To be honest, I was just completely done with this game. Just, just over it. The rulebook was just so confusing with its organization and weird conversational style, and then the tutorial when we started it was 10 scenarios and barely teaches you how a turn looks like until later on, so we had to use the player reference, this spark notes player reference to understand any semblance on how a turn works. I had a feeling that this game would be really cool once figured out, but to get there, my brain was melting and I really wanted to give up. It was like, oh my god, Ashton, you, you've overstepped your bounds with this crazy naval game. I don't know what you're doing. Why are we making a review on this? This is just crazy. But I did it. I freaking did it. I learned the game. I played through 10 of these by myself, the 10 tutorial scenarios. I did the solo mode. I did the two player mode. Yes, I went across the English Channel and I swam across it to learn Atlantic Chase and play it and finish a game. But uh, yeah, I wasn't quite quite smothered in champagne in celebration when I was finished with everything. I found that the decision space is just way too bonkers for me. The open-ended nature of the design means that right off the bat, you have a bajillion decisions. For diddly old me to operate an entire operation featuring different speeds of ships, accounting for the weather, and constantly trying to outpath your opponents is draining. Really, really cool sounding with the ships and scale but it really crosses the line in intensity, as after a while, I just want the game to end because I'm tired. Actually, another thing that I'm tired about is the dice rolling. This again has gone way and beyond that realm of too much for me. At a glance, it's like, well, yeah, duh, this makes sense. There's tons of randomness in this game, so use the dice to account for that. But in practice, when I'm rolling dice for almost every single action, and then checking these little tables to see what happens, it gets tiring. The big last grievance is that the setup has always been an atrocious experience for me. I kid you not, I absolutely detest this game while setting it up and just want to give up and not play the game. When I actually play the game, that physically ill feeling disappears. The game's strategy is so nuanced that the setup feels like it's worth it, right? But then as I said, the game's intensity is just a little too much for me. There is something about this game though, Atlantic Chase, that continues to stay on my mind. The trajectory system leads into gameplay that I've never experienced before. The game is immensely satisfying at times, when you finally catch that graph speed and your blood is boiling from all those turns you've been chasing it and then you land a hit on a surprise attack and it's finally, finally slowed down. But then on the other side, when the graph speed escapes, man, that must have been the frustration that the British planners felt in World War II all the time. It just doesn't do much right for being a board game I want to return to. The setup is way too long, the rolling gets tiring, the pieces feel kind of gross on my hands, and then even putting down trajectory pieces, which is the main part of the game, 
gets tiring when the game is so long and you're constantly putting them down and then taking them off as time passes. For how much I am in awe by this strategy and realism, I don't think I'll ever play this again, even if someone does set up this game for me. I guess I am just not the salty grognard I thought I could be. Okay, before I get to the patrons, I like to say this video took me a long time to make. So, uh, I probably won't be doing GMT games anytime soon, but thank you guys so much for your support. Remember to like and sub. Anyways, this video is brought to you by our patrons. We got John S, Manuel G, Brian C, Clifford H, Aaron W, Max B, Bora, Jeremy MC, Charlie P, Quentin S, Sam S, Travis R, Alvin Y, Vonsky, Ryan D, Jeff L, Jabran, Matt G, Peter Z, Spinner 71, Ryan J, Brad G, Tiamo, Period, Mark A, and James, James M, Evan B, Charles P Jr., Josh J, Baspar, Tyler, Tyler R, Rado, Sophie, <laughs> Sophie, and Rainer Z. And we got two man lads of cardboard, we got ZL and Jeff L, and we got one man lady of cardboard, we got Amy. Okay, well, this was a crazy journey to review this game, so I'd really appreciate it if you liked the video and drop a sub. It really helps us out. And uh, yeah, the pandemic is uh, winding down for us over here, so expect more reviews. Daniel's coming in. Yeah, see you more in these videos. See you guys later. Bye-bye.